Welcome to season four of the Today is a Good Day podcast, a podcast to bring you a new point of support as you navigate your NICU journey. This season, you will hear even more personal stories from families who have been where you are today. Some of the stories you will hear will provide you with important advice from medical professionals like case managers and high-risk OBGYNs. You will also hear advice about opportunities you can take to focus on self-care and more. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Today is a Good Day podcast wherever you enjoy your podcast or share this episode with anyone who might find it helpful. Parenthood is an adventure for all of us. Today's guest knows this adventure well. Lena Young and her high school sweetheart husband are the parents to nine beautiful children, including a set of twins and a set of quadruplets born nearly eight months ago. Lena is a stay-at-home mom sharing her family's adventures through her Instagram page, Raising Our Youngs. We are excited to have her here with us today. Welcome, Lena. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Lena, again, so glad to have you here. Thanks for coming to the Philadelphia area for this special podcast episode. Tell us about your beautiful family. Oh, it is crazy, but it's beautiful. Like you said, it's full hands, but much fuller hearts. They're absolutely amazing. It's a lot of work, but with all of that, it's nine times the fun and the love. So yeah, we're really fortunate. And tell us about your your start to building your family? Um, well, so our daughter, Aubrey, she's nine and a half. Um, she was our sweet high school surprise, <laughs> um, but she couldn't have come at a more perfect time. She's wonderful. And then we got married, got settled out of college for my husband, and we had our son, Elijah. He was our first experience in the NICU. Then a couple years later, we or we had a miscarriage after that. Then we had our twins and Asher and completed our family with the quads. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah. I, I know you mentioned the NICU experience. Yes. So you have had a few NICU experiences. Yes. Technically, your... eight of our nine kids have been in the NICU. Aubrey was only in there for a couple of hours. So we kind of dismissed that compared to our other stays. But yeah, all of our boys and Aurora were in there. And you've had a full-term experience in the NICU and a premature yes. and premature experiences yeah. in the NICU. Tell us about Much the full-term experience in the NICU. Yeah, so the full-term, my pregnancy, I get very sick during pregnancy, but besides that, we had no issues. So it was very blindsiding. You know, we had a very smooth pregnancy. I worked up until like two days before I gave birth. So we went in, gave birth to our son, Elijah. He was born weighing 11 pounds. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And he came very fast. So, you know, we're doing the skin to skin that you do after you have a baby. And right away, the nurses noticed he wasn't breathing properly. So they said, we're going to take him up to the NICU to watch him. And then from there, it was just a completely different experience than we ever thought. With our preemies, you know, we kind of knew, or with our twins and quads, we knew there was probably a chance they'd be in the NICU. But to have a full-term baby go up there was kind of devastating in a way. I was like, "What did? where did this go wrong? What's happening? So yeah, we went in there and you're not even affected just by your child, but just all the other babies in there. I was holding my 11 pound baby thinking like, oh, this small little baby, he's having a hard time. And then we walked in there to see these one pound babies and it just stops you in your tracks. It's very intense. Well, that's one of the things that I did want to ask you about, because we talk to families frequently. Now, obviously, our family's experience, we had 23 weekers. So right. we were in the NICU, that extended stay, those micro preemies. But we have talked to families with full-term babies, and we work with families, and they talk about the experience being so different. Was that the same for you, having the the full-term 11-pound baby in the NICU? Yeah, we for sure thought it would kind of just be like a couple hours stay. He'll be out tomorrow. He'll get discharged with us. And he was in there for a week, so much less than our quads. Um, but still, you just think, oh, a full-term baby, they're done growing. Everything should be good. So to see it not that way was like, very scary. And thinking that he would only be in the NICU for a couple of hours, right. that didn't end up happening. Yeah. How did you get through managing those new expectations? Yeah, especially my, I mean, my husband, he just kept asking our nurse, so like, when is he coming back to our, our room? And they're like, we, you know, we don't know. He has to get his stuff under control. And we just kept assuming like, okay, you know, he'll be back tonight. He'll be back tomorrow. And we were waiting to bring our daughter in to meet him. And then it kind of turned into, okay, she's coming into the NICU to meet him. 
because that's where he is. But I think just taking it moment by moment, it definitely did prepare me for our future NICU stays because I kind of knew what to expect. So I kind of think that's why he got in there, just to give me a little, a safe dose of it before we had premature babies. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a lot no matter what. And, and how did that premature experience first with your set of twins, how did that differ from having him in the NICU as a full-term baby? So with twins, we were pretty much like we, we kind of had that preparation that, OK, we're probably going to have babies that have to go to the NICU versus a full time pregnancy where you just expect to give birth to a healthy baby, recover and go home, have a good life. So we were pretty confident we'd have a NICU stay. And then we kind of had an idea of what to expect as far as, OK, they're going to have to be weaned off of things because, you know, we walked in to see our son on oxygen and my husband and I just broke down crying. We're like, why is he on oxygen? Like that's a life that's, we need, we need to be able to breathe. So that was very traumatic, but going into it with our preemies, we're like, okay, you know, it's not a horrible thing. If they're on oxygen, they just have to take one step at a time. And actually our twins that came at 34 weeks never needed oxygen. So it was just like, wow. every baby is different. You know, mm -hmm. our full-term baby needed oxygen for six days and our six week early babies didn't need any. So that's the other hard part. You're just, you compare to everyone else. You compare when you have multiples, you compare them to each other. So it's just one thing at a time. Well, I think you bring up a good point too, is that every baby is different. So right? different. Yeah. It's really hard because you can read stories about babies born at 29 weeks, right. at 27 weeks, at 23 weeks, at 35 weeks. And every baby's story is so different. Yeah. It makes it hard to find support because you're like, what's the normal? What should my baby be doing at 32 weeks or whatever? But though it's such a big range, you really don't know. It's whatever their normal exactly. is. Exactly. Right? And sure. what they're showing you each 100%. day. 100%. So I know you talked about having your full-term baby in the NICU and how that kind of prepared you for your twins and then and then later right. your quads coming. What did it feel like, though, stepping into that NICU again? And what came back? Did, did emotions come flooding back? I mean, how did it feel? Yeah, I, I definitely, surprisingly, I did feel more confident. I was kind of like, I've been here before. I kind of know what to expect, what's going on. But now I was tackling it with two babies instead of one. You know, when my son was in the NICU, not only are you trying to um, recover from a delivery, which no matter how that goes, it's a lot on your body. But now I was trying to recover and breastfeed for two babies. And that was very overwhelming. And not only are they trying to, you know, practice their oxygen, their blood sugars, they're trying to eat. So I never knew... If I'm pushing them too much, if we're doing the right thing, what the right call is, it's a lot of questioning yourself through every step. But yeah, I was just as emotional. I don't know if you felt the same, but one of the best pieces of advice, while it seems so simple, someone said to us early on because we were struggling, how do we make these decisions? Look at these choices we have to make, right? And I'll never forget, he said, you need to make the best decisions you can based upon the information that you have. And yeah, while that is such a simple statement, that's what you have to come back to, right? Exactly. Yes. Because I feel like in the NICU, like for us with our quads, especially, you know, we had multiple nurses, multiple doctors each day. So we're trying to focus on this baby, this doctor and so forth. But we're always getting different information. We had a very great team behind us. But for instance, a lot of them, Arlo had a brain bleed. Some doctors would say we're going to do a scan. Some doctors would say we're going to give it time. And it's like, Okay, well, I don't know the right call. You guys are the doctors. So, but then part of it, you just have to use your parental instinct. And, you know, we were a better safe than sorry. We want the scan. So mm -hmm. we know what we're dealing with. But yeah. And that goes back. And we talk a lot with families about just asking questions, right. asking questions, asking questions. Did you all, I'm sure yes. you all did that so all many the questions. time, right? Yeah. I would kind of apologize. I'd be like, sorry, but I have another question because I just needed to know. It brings you a little bit of comfort in such an unknowing time. And how did you keep track of everything? Did you journal? Did yes, you... your guys' journals. Ah. Yes. I'll, each baby had a Today is a Good Day journal, and we would take notes on each baby, each visit, the good time from that visit, the hard times. We would update their weight, how much they were eating, everything like that. Wonderful. Yes. Oh, that's so, so great to hear. I, that was one of the most important things yes. that I remember. I and and being things. able to refer back to it. Yes, especially when you have multiples. You're, exactly. And you're exhausted mentally, physically, everything. So it's nice to go home and be like, just a recap. Now, I do have to ask you, I love your thoughts on this too. When you're in the NICU, 
it is a roller coaster as we talk about. Mm -hmm. And so often you take two steps forward and you take two steps back. You've had multiple NICU stays. How did you do that? Oh, man, it's a lot. So much. I mean, Arlo, he was definitely our most challenging in the NICU out of our quads. He had a brain bleed. He had a heart murmur. And, you know, all the other babies, they're off oxygen. They're eating. And it's kind of like, why are you not doing that, Arlo? Like, you guys are all quads. You should all be doing the same thing. But you have to remember they're individuals also, even though they're multiples. But I think just comfort in people around you, family, friends, and like it, m- taking one moment at a time is really my biggest thing. It's easy to focus on. I remember the first week we were there, every day I would ask, when are they coming home? And the doctors would be like, we don't, there's not like a date. There's not like, okay, they'll be home March 3rd. It's just each baby takes their own steps and you have to find a lot of strength within yourself. I constantly felt like I was failing as a mom, failing my kids at home when I was in the NICU, failing my NICU kids when I was at home. It really sucked having them separated and just not everyone together. So, yeah, you just have to – my biggest advice would be just be gracious with yourself and just try your best through each day. Well, you bring – and listen, I know you and I have talked about this. You can cry whenever you I want say, with it's me. coming I out. I still do. I still do. <laughs> Nearly try to keep it together. Twelve years later, there are yes. moments where the tears just come, and, and they do because yeah. we have been through so many traumatic right. experiences, and it's okay. Yeah, right? I feel like no one in the world should have to struggle with anything, but then to see, like – two pound babies doing it, it Mm -hmm. just changes you forever. Well, you you mentioned about having the older kids at home. Yeah. And you've gone through that multiple times. Right. That's something we talk to families about a lot because there is this balance and and we didn't have that personal experience, Mm -hmm. but the families that we work with and many of our volunteers with Today's Good Day, that's what they had. They had older kids at home. How did you get through that? How did you balance the time? It was, you know, when we had our son in the NICU, our full-term son, our daughter and grandparents could come visit. So she could still meet him even though he was there and be around it. But then with COVID, it changed everything. It was strictly parents. Um, We didn't have time limits on our visit, thankfully, but I know in the past they did. But yeah, so I mean, you know, I'd go home from maybe a horrible visit with the babies, maybe a good visit with the babies, but I'd go home and the first thing Aubrey and Eli, my older kids are saying like, when are they coming home? Can we see a picture? When do we get to meet them? And as much as you want to give them a date or a reliable answer, there just isn't one. So then you see them upset, which just is the icing on a already hard day. Mm -hmm. And then such as like FaceTiming while you're there, anything like that, you want to be respectful to all the families around you. So I can't just sit there, you know, FaceTiming with my kids at home where I might have one kid having a tantrum and trying to show them the babies. But it's it's very intense. It's a lot of emotions. We just encourage them that, you know, we would have our older kids draw pictures, bring that to the babies. Um, Our daughter is very artistic. Our son was always bringing them stuffed animals. I'd usually leave them in the car because I'm like, I can't keep bringing all this in there. But it allowed them to feel like they were participating in the baby's NICU stay. Um, I would take videos at home, record them, and play them by the baby's bedside. Idea. Yeah, and then all of the babies each had a printed out picture of us, of our family, sitting at their bedside. And, you know, I would just tell them, even when we're not here, we're all here. So we're going to be home soon. All beautiful ideas yes. for older siblings at home. Yes. I mean, making the pictures, doing exactly. the stuffed animals, the family photo at the bedside, right. always to help the kids at home feel. Yes, and we had your bonding squares. So not only would I wear those, the they're a little piece of fabric where, you know, you wear one for your scent and the baby wears one for their scent. I would let the kids wear those. So, yeah, really just be involved. What did it feel like and look like in your home when everyone – graduated from the NICU and you had all nine. Oh, man. (laughs) Yes. So Erickson was our last one to come home. First, it was Arlo. A couple days later, Aurora and Edwin, and then Erickson. And I remember we got the phone call. Erickson can come home. You know, we're so excited. We called our babysitter, uh, my father-in-law. We don't really have a babysitter, but my father-in-law. And as we were getting to walk out, my son, Aiden, he is three, threw up all over my husband. (laughs) Literally perfect timing. And said he had a stomach bug. So, and then after that, Elijah and Aubrey both started throwing up. So we were kind of just sitting there and throw up like, okay, we're going to go bring home another baby (laughs) to this. (laughs) Great. So I actually discharged him by myself while my husband got thrown up on at home. 
But yeah, so the first couple of days was really intense because we all came down with a stomach bug. Oh my my mom actually flew in from Florida to manage the babies and keep them in like our guest bedroom while the rest of the house was throwing up just sick. But once we got past the stomach bug, it was pretty great. <laughs> Loud, lots of bottle propping, and just working together. And I feel like when you have a preemie, it's just so different. I mean, now my babies, they're eight months old. I can bathe each of them in like three minutes flat. As a preemie where you're worried about body temperature and am I taking too long, whatever, it was like 25-minute baths. So all of that stuff really adds up. Lots of exhaustion, Mm -hmm. but I still really wanted our older kids to be included. So I would pump. I would let them bottle feed them. But yeah, just survival mode. But you made it through it. Yes, survival mode with a lot of love and a lot of humor. Yes. That's what we did. And we do talk about a lot. It feels like those chunks of time are just ongoing. Right. That they're never going to end. And they change. Yes. But those really difficult times you can get through. Yes. And even long stays in the NICU. and, And we talk with families a lot about, I, I in fact, was just talking with a family yesterday about about how long they had already made it in the NICU. And did you think from the beginning you'd be able to make it this far and look how far you've made it, right? Yeah, each day you're just getting closer to that You can keep going. Yes. You've made it through how many days you can push through these last couple for sure. I'm going to change the topic a little bit. But you've also experienced a miscarriage. Yes, we did. And share a little bit about that. So we, you know, we had our daughter in high school, so we waited a couple of years till my husband was done with college to get married and really start building our family. So we had Elijah, who, besides the NICU, was a pretty good pregnancy. Um, we've never had any issues getting pregnant, so it was kind of just like, all right, like, you know, we're stable in life, career, we bought a house, let's have another baby. We went in for our first sonogram, and they said the baby's measuring small, but has a heartbeat. So we'll just bring you back in like a week or two, see how things are going. And I kind of naively was like, I don't drink, you know, I'm a healthy individual. So why would we have any complications? Um, So we went back two weeks later and there was unfortunately no heartbeat in the baby. So it was, again, just very blindsiding because I just kind of felt immune to that. Like I'm a healthy, younger woman. I've never had any issues with as far as like fertility and stuff goes. So I didn't understand it, but yeah, it was really rough. It was rough to move on from because when you find out you're pregnant, you, I mean, for me personally, I'm envisioning my life with three kids now. Like, okay, we're no longer a family of four. We're now a family of five. So what kind of car do we need? What's our next car seat going to be? And you just start envisioning your life with this baby. So yeah, it was very tough, but amazingly, we got our twins after. So Mm -hmm. my husband always says that was our way of getting the baby we lost back. So, but yeah, I would say take time to grieve. You know, right away, our doctor was like, yeah, you guys can try again in a month. And I was like, there is no way I will be ready for that. Like, I definitely need to take my time. And I didn't even know if I'd want another baby. We knew we wanted a large family, but I was like, this pain is unbearable. I just don't want to ever go through this again. And unfortunately, and a lot of times I blame myself. I don't know what I would have done, but it's easy to blame myself. But looking back now, it's just unfortunately something that happens. And and I and I think going. we do blame ourselves in yeah. so many ways, and it's not our fault. Even for sure. with, I mean, going back to the NICU, I you know when we went to the hospital that night, I was like, "There's no way I'm in labor with these quads. Like, there's no way we're only 29 weeks." And they're like, "Oh yeah, you know, you're like six centimeters dilated. You're in labor," and I just refused to accept it because I was like, "Nope, it's not time for them to come yet. My body's failing me." Mm-hmm. But then on the other side, you have to be like, I've carried four babies this far right. and I've done the best I can for them. So, yeah, it's it's easy to attack yeah. ourselves, but we ultimately have to know that we're just doing our best and well, it's out of our control. Exactly. And and when you bring up that idea of take time to grieve, not only right. through the loss that you experienced, exactly. but also we talk about a lot with NICU stays. Yes. It's grieving that full pregnancy that you had anticipated. I I didn't even know that was a thing. I call it like NICU PTSD because people talk, you know, we get asked a lot, are you guys going to have any more kids? And I, in my head, I'm like, God, no, like I cannot even think of going through another high risk pregnancy, another NICU stay. I cannot handle it. But then a part of me is like, but at the same time, it'd be so nice to have just an easy pregnancy and a baby that comes on time. And we have the little birth photographer in our labor and delivery room catching all these beautiful photos. But yeah, 
you just you miss out on all that when you have a preemie. You do. And we've talked in some past episodes around that, that grief of just missing those those big moments right. of having that full pregnancy right. and what you had expected and exactly. managing. And what? even just bringing your baby home. Exactly. I mean, mm-hmm. leaving the hospital, for instance, with our quads, we left on Christmas Day and it was like a dagger to the heart. Mm-hmm. I was like their first Christmas. They're spending it in the hospital alone. Bad mom, horrible mom leaving my babies, but I also have my other kids at home and it's Christmas for them. So I'm like trying to manage Christmas for everybody. But yeah, leaving the hospital empty handed is really rough. And I bet they remember a very joyous day. Yes. Your older kids. Yes, I pulled in. I was crying the whole way home, but I pulled in and they were all banging on the window. My dog's nose was like smushed against Uh. the window. And yeah, they were so happy to see you. You did get a dog great. recently, right? Not too not not recently. We had one. We got one during COVID times, mm-hmm. but we talk about getting another dog. Oh we my crazy. goodness! Yeah, <laughs> we would rescue an adult dog. No puppies. No puppies. How do the kids love? Oh, he's the great. Pu- the dog. Yes, he's great. He's a great dog. We don't, you know, allow him the kids to crawl all over him. But if they do, while we're turned around or something, he's amazing. Even with the babies, he plops right by them every night by our bed. He used to sleep in our bed, but now he's like, nope, I got to sleep by my baby. Oh, so. oh my gosh. He sleeps so right sweet. on the ground of all four bassinets. <laughs> so when you were in the NICU, going through all that, trying to support your kids at home, be with the babies at the NICU as well, and, and even with your twins and um, your other NICU stays, Talk to us about your breastfeeding journey because you did breastfeed all four quads, right? For the, the three quads. and a half months, yes. Oh my goodness. So with Elijah, that was our first NICU baby, um, he latched perfect. So breastfeeding was easy. With my daughter, I formula fed her. I kind of thought breastfeeding was weird. It just wasn't about it. But the NICU, they pressured, not really pressured, they just enforced how important breast milk can be for them. So I really pushed through my mm-hmm. discomfort and wanted to nurse Elijah and he latched and did great. And we nursed for 14 months. It was amazing. Yeah. Once we got past the hard times, I really did enjoy it. It was just a big snuggle session. And then with the twins, it was a little more intimidating having multiples. Um, But we still did it for about six weeks. Asher wasn't that long at all. But then the quads, I was really just determined knowing how premature they were, how good it was for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was breastfeeding, pumping around the clock. Oh man, it was a lot. I always had a pump or a mouth attached to me. Yes. Yeah. Full time. Yeah. It was a lot, but I was constantly engorged. There was like no such thing. A lot of people on my Instagram would message me saying, you know, pump until you're empty. I was like, that is not a thing. It's never empty. (laughs) It's just like keeps going. A faucet of never ending milk. But yeah, we made it to three and a half months and then we um, were taking our older kids to Disney. And I just remember being like, today is about my older kids. My mom was watching the babies. I was like, I am not pumping today. I am going on Disney rides and it's going to be great. And I was very sore, but that's kind of when I weaned out of the pumping Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. But yeah, we lasted pretty good. And that was another thing I really um, grieved, just like an easy breastfeeding journey. Because if they'd all latched good, I feel like it could have gone a lot better. But there was so many things. I mean, they're t- they're not strong enough to suck hard enough. You know, a bottle gives milk to them easier than when they're nursing. So I was really determined to push through it. But, yeah, it ended up being more on both of us because the baby would get frustrated. They're not getting milk. I'm getting frustrated. I'm leaking. I have to pump. It was a lot. Very overwhelming. But I'm really proud of us how far we made it. Well, so. and I think you, you said – the right thing here and you do the best you can. Exactly. And I think that relates to so many of us. I mean, I had the same type of pumping journey in the NICU and just didn't have great supply with the, the grief and what we were going through. Oh yeah. So the, you do the best that you can. Yes. I remember in the NICU, I was getting ready to pump and they're like, remember, make sure you're getting good enough to sleep at night and you're not stressed out because it can affect your milk supply. And I looked at her and I was like, do you know, I have four premature babies in the NICU, (laughs) like sleep and stress are, I'm not doing good on those. And, <laughs> and five no other sleep children. and a lot of stress on top of five other children. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was like, that's a joke. Oh, my goodness. Well, good for you. Doing the best we can. That's, yep. that's what it's that's all about. Model, doing the best yeah. we can. When we when when you, we graduate from the NICU and right. when we talk with, you know, friends, family members, like, oh, good, you're home. Everything's going to be great now. That's not always the case. That stings hearing yes, that. Not yeah. always the case. And there are appointments and follow-up appointments and early intervention. Yes. 
So how'd you, how did you transition into that next chapter? Well, naively, I was kind of the one who was like, okay, they're home. Everything's perfect. But then right away, we realized like Erickson's body temperature, he was not maintaining it. I think it had to be like 97.5. He was constantly like 94. So we were in the doctor's office at least two times a week, getting that checked, seeing if we had to be admitted to the hospital. And all these doctor's appointments, I'm loading up my nine kids and going. Oh I definitely God. got tired of us. But I was, I'm a worried mom. So, yeah, it's not just come home and everything's great. It was regular temperature checks, um, nonstop burping. Edwin had a really hard time digesting formula when we switched over to that from being exclusively breast milk. So he would constantly spit up, lose weight. Um, for us personally, we had an at-home nurse who came to our house for two times a week. I think it was for about eight to ten weeks after they were home. So, yeah, it's never ending. It's not just this. I'm glad it looks like that. I feel like it looks like that to a lot of people. Like, your baby's doing so good. And it's like, if you knew everything I was doing to keep this baby good, <laughs> it's a lot. A lot, yes. a lot of work behind right. the scenes. Do you have any tips for other families? I mean, how have you managed all of the appointments? What's your, um, what's it look like? I expect to be late. We're late for everything in life. <laughs> but just just patience and try to prepare the best you can. I always say if it's something that's bothering you, definitely go in. Um, if I got a low temperature, I was like, for my peace of mind, we just need to go in because I know it's going to be something that's stressing me out and I'm going to kick myself in the butt if we don't go in. Edwin's had a lot of breathing stuff. So it's just trying to manage each baby's needs on their own. Arlo and Aurora haven't had really any issues since they came home, but they just tag along for all the other doctor's appointments. And I'll never forget our pediatrician said to us, that's why we have a 24 hour line. Martha. Yes. That's why sure. pediatricians are sure. open. Exactly. Because we want to hear from you. If yes. there's something that's concerning you, that's why we're here. We're right. Here and to support your family. And, you know, we went to the ER one time and I remember they made, someone made a comment. One of the nurses like, oh, you're going first time mom on me. I was like, nope, I'm going caring mom on you. Like yes. I care for my child and you're paid to work. So we're here to keep you busy. <laughs> yep. How'd the older kids do with the babies coming in. They did really good. Asher, our 18-month-old, he kind of didn't care either way. He's like, yeah, it's cool. It's a little noisy, but it sleeps a lot too, so whatever. Um, my boys, though, Elijah, Aiden, and Everett, my older boys, they loved it very surprisingly. My daughter was very sister-obsessed. She had four brothers before Aurora came. So, yeah, the boys took the boys, and Aubrey took Aurora. It was lots of snuggling sessions, but it was good that our older kids were in school. That definitely helped with the transition. I mean, I look really hot mess when I'm dropping them off in the morning with nine kids in the car, still like in a bathrobe, but we made it there, so we got through it. But yeah, it was a really beautiful transition to watch. They're all very excited. Your van is impressive. Oh, yes. It's like a school bus on I know. Yes. I'm a so white glad bus. that you brought all the kids here. Yes. That's and great. it has a very inappropriate bumper sticker. I don't know if you've seen that. I didn't. I it didn't. Says, too much shagging had to get a wagon. Oh. <laughs> very inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very inappropriate. That was my husband's idea. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. But yeah. You got to just find humor in parenthood. You do. So you do. Got a wagon full of kids. There you, you go. Do. Beautiful children. Thank you. Now that you are post NICU, you're out of the NICU nearly. Uh, we actually have a visit next month with the NICU. Okay. It's like okay. a six month, you've been home, how's everything going? But yes. yeah. So now that you've been out six months, the, right. the quads are nearly eight months old. Yes. How many appointments do you have? What's um, it look like? Do you have a lot of specialist follow-ups? We have at least one weekly appointment and they get evaluated by early intervention um, on September 12th. So, okay. but they're being evaluated by everything. Speech, teacher aid, which I didn't even know that was a thing for babies, but I guess it is. I didn't even know speech was a thing for babies, but they check their mouth movements and whatever. I'm like, okay, physical therapy. So, yeah, there, it's like a five-hour appointment. They'll be peeking at everything, but it's great that they have those services. But once again, you just feel, I'm like, my body betrayed me. It brought these babies in too early. Now they're going to be struggling through simple things that they shouldn't have to struggle through. But yeah, we'll see what they need. And then all I can do is support them in the help that they need, whichever way it goes. You share a lot about your family story. What yeah. what made you start to do that? What what start what made you begin the launch the Instagram page? Yes. Yeah, so I think I posted like five times before we got pregnant with our quads. I did not post at all. 
And then I was seeing reels and just, you know, like pregnancy reels, dancing ones that were fun. And I was kind of like, I'm never going to experience this again. So I really just want to document it. With my daughter, I was a teenage pregnancy and it was super frowned upon. So I don't even think I have like one belly picture pregnant with my daughter and I can't stand that. So I was like, I'm just really going to document this time of our lives. And some reels are funny, some are sad. And then when I got into the NICU, I was kind of like, all right, I'll stop. But a lot of NICU parents reached out to me and they're like, we're going through this too. I love that you're sharing this. Or, you know, we're pregnant with triplets and we're going to be going through this. So the community that I became a, a part of was just really humbling. So, yeah, I just kept sharing our story. Everything in the NICU, reading to the babies, a lot of people, you know, they'd want baby updates, big sibling updates, how's everyone doing? So we really became a part of this amazing group of people that were all praying for us. Isn't it an incredible Including community? you guys. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're so glad we connected with you. Yes. But isn't it an incredible community? It I mean, really I it was so humbling. Like, I'm like, these people don't even know us and our babies are getting thousands of prayers sent their way. It was mm -hmm. very amazing. Yeah. It's just a, it's a group that you stay connected with yes. forever who, you know, want to. even if they personally didn't go through a NICU experience, they're just, they're taken away by your story and they just really feel for you. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that a stranger from Connecticut never met nothing, never talked to. She's praying for our kids. That was really incredible. That's powerful. Yes. And speaking of that, where can our listeners follow your story? I'm mainly on Instagram, Raising Our Youngs. I do have a TikTok, but I don't post on there a lot. I also have a YouTube that I don't post on a lot, all under Raising Our Youngs, but it's just busy. <laughs> Life, think the day a is a little busy, busy so <laughs> it's hard to post on like four social media platforms so mainly Instagram but I'm pretty much in my stories there so the days the kids and I go on a lot of adventures and that's another thing I've connected with now now that we're kind of past the NICU stuff but still working through it just a lot of moms in general they're just you know I can't even get out of the house with my two kids how are you doing it with nine and I'm like we're just a hot mess ex hot mess express bus trucking along Lots Love of patience, lots of snacks, but it was important to me that our big kids didn't feel, okay, the babies are home and get resentful toward them that we're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So the babies may not enjoy the zoo. They don't really care, but my big kids are going to. So we load them all up and we go to the zoo or do whatever we do. Wonderful. Making great memories. Exactly. Yes, yes for sure. Now you have experienced so many different journeys, full-term NICU, full-term birth, NICU right. experience. Miscarriage. What, what is your biggest piece of advice for families? I would definitely say patience and just kind of trusting the plan set in front of you. With our miscarriage and our premature babies, it was kind of like, why me? You know, why does God or whatever you believe in, why do they think I'm strong enough to handle this? Because I'm clearly not, you know, I would have an emotional meltdown every day, missing my babies at home, missing my babies in the NICU vice versa. So I would just say, be gracious with yourself, lots of patience, lots of snacks, <laughs> lots of snacks. And ultimately, our, our family just runs smooth because we just, you know, we don't let a bad moment in our day turn the whole day into a bad experience. Our, my kids have tantrums. That's a big thing on Instagram. Your kids are so perfect. They never have tantrums. I'm like, do you want to see the Cheetos in my car right now that they just built in the backseat out of their tantrum? <laughs> It's covered in Cheetos, and I'm pretty sure there's a cheeseburger back there. <laughs> but it's just taking that moment, working through it together, and then, you know, moving on. Still finding joy in the day. And especially after the NICU, I think you just really learn to appreciate even the hardest moments. You know, we went from weighing diapers. I remember praying Arlo would just pee. Like, please, just pee so we know your liver is working. And now it's like, I will change every poop explosion diaper there is. And you will see me change it with a smile on my face because I'm not weighing it and your body's working. So that's kind of just how I get through it. Positivity, yep. patience. Yeah. We're very grateful for sure. They all made it home. That was something we were told that probably wouldn't happen. So it even hits us harder. Mm -hmm. I still remember finding out we were pregnant with four babies. And the first thing was they probably will not all survive. You got to keep that in mind between preterm lab pre labor and growth restrictions. And every doctor's appointment was like, well, if we make it another two weeks without going into labor, we'll, you know, focus on this. So very, very grateful. 
Taking it one moment at exactly. a time as you shared earlier. Yes, and it goes by so fast. So one day I won't have diapers to change. I'll sleep a full night. But until then, I'm just going to soak all this in. <laughs> Well, thank you for becoming a part of the Today's a Good Day community. And just know you are really making an impact for so many families I and making a you difference. Saying that. Thank you so them. much. Well, you guys are making the impact. You're incredible. Well, thank you. Thanks for being on our podcast. Yes, it was I great to hear your story. It. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, Life Celebration by Givnish.